Oh, hey, everybody. I'm talking to you while I'm in the middle of a solution. You know how you can tell? My laser pointer goes right through it when you can't see the path. And that's because solutions are transparent to light. That was my fog machine. I have a fog machine in my basement for reasons which are very much my own. But now check it out. You can see the path of the light. And that's because colloids scatter light. And so I can see the path of these laser pointer beams. Suspensions block light. So if you want to know if something is a solution, a suspension, or a colloid, just shine some light on it. All right, so let's go talk more about solutions, colloids, and suspensions, especially before the popcorn lung takes hold. Well, howdy everybody, howdy. Mike here, and I've, I've recovered from my little coughing fit. Uh, that was just acting, actually. Really good, isn't it? Really good acting. But uh, nonetheless, I did fog the heck out of my basement, and people in my house are not happy with me. By the way, that fog is glycerol. It's the same thing that's in vape juice, and uh, not necessarily all that good to breathe a lot, but it is kind of does kind of hang in the air a little bit. And so that would be an example of a colloid. And now in the OpenStax book, they kind of talk about colloidal systems, and that includes you know suspensions and colloids. They don't use the term solute and solvent anymore. Now they use the term uh, dispersed phase and dispersing phase. But the reason and what happens here, folks, is the reason you see it start to interact with light is due to the particle size. So anything less than say, and these are real loose numbers, all right, so don't hold me to this exactly. You get less than say 100 angstroms, and now that's smaller than a wavelength of light the particles are, and they're not big enough in order to uh, interact with the light. So what happens is you can diagnose something as a solution if it's transparent. So do they separate out? Never. So, you know, if they stayed in their state, I mean, if so, if you took salt water, of course, the water could evaporate, and then you could say, well, hey, that, that separated out. Well, just assuming it was in the same state as it was. So, so here, here is a good example. I've got this, uh, uh, what we call in science, glass of water, and I could go ahead and just uh, make a solution. And even though it has a color, it will still make the light, uh, it, the light can still go through it. So I uh, see, prove that it's coming out the other end, right? There's my hand, it's coming out the other end. If I were to go and get sort of fancy with it and uh, do other things to it, I could make a uh, colloid or a suspension. So uh, we'll do that, we'll talk about that as we go along. And so it's really the particle size, but of course you can't see particles, but that, that's how it all works. We see evidence of their interaction with other things. Colloid, you know, this could be greater than 100 angstroms and maybe less than uh, uh, to 1,000 angstroms. And, and that is very, very uh, loose. And you could say suspension is greater than 1,000 angstroms. So once you get greater than a wavelength of light, now you have, depending on the size of the particles, you're either going to have, in terms of a colloid, you're going to have, like, we, like in my basement with the glycerol, scattering of light, and uh, you will see the path. You could have, um, you could separate it, I'll say maybe, if you use the right gizmo. There's things called centrifuges, which will allow them to separate. And so let's go make an example of a colloid. Here we are 
we're back again with my glass of water and I got some good old lemon juice. Maybe you drink this if you have, if you have uh, had kidney stones. The doctor might tell you to drink exactly this. Throw some lemon juice in the water. See how it's kind of cloudy? And then what I can do is I can sort of... And that interaction, and I'm not so sure how great the camera's picking it up. You see a, something called a Tyndall cone. And so you see that it's coming out the other end, but also there is a cone-like effect, like headlights coming through you in the fo at you in the fog. And so that scattering is what's indicative of a colloid. Suspensions just flat out block light. And the suspensions usually, unless they have help, which we will talk about, unless they have help, they uh, through a third party molecule that will keep them mixed, they will eventually settle out. So you could, you know, milk has been homogenized, but if you know the real way milk is, is that cream will separate out to the top. Here's an example of a suspension. I've got some Zeste Italian salad dressing. And then if I go and try to shoot it through the uh, container here, it ain't coming out the other end. Nothing. So that'll flat out block that light. Not scatter, not transmit block. And so there you go, folks. If you've got a laser pointer, you've got a way to find out, is this thing a solution? Is it a colloid or a suspension? And so next, unfortunately, what happens is a lot of these things have buzz names. So for example, in this, the age of airborne diseases, you're probably hearing a lot about aerosols. That is a liquid suspended in a gas and uh, you may have heard of an emulsion. An emulsion is when you suspend, it doesn't matter if it's colloid or suspension, it can get, kind of uses the term. If you make a vinaigrette and you, or, or mayonnaise, you're making an emulsion. That's a liquid in another liquid. And so uh, here, after that I took out of your, the OpenStax book, here is a bunch of names for a bunch of colloidal systems. And we're going to be short with you today. We're going to just talk about one more thing, and uh, then we will uh, set you free. And uh, chapter 11 goes out with a little bit of a whimper. So here's a bunch of names of colloidal systems. All right. Now here I wanted to talk about things that touch your life a little bit. You might have heard of these terms called emulsifiers. Emulsifiers are things that cause things to mix with others that don't normally do so. Uh, for example, here is, and you'll see, sometimes it'll say emulsifier on the label. I wonder if you could catch that right there. Emulsifier, right? On this jar of speculus cookie and cocoa swirl and so you find a lot of things like hey you, if you make mayonnaise it's it's egg whites and oil does that stay mixed together indefinitely well there they put emulsifiers in there a lot of things that are emulsifiers call, are called lecithins and um, a great example of an emulsifier is this great molecule called soap so here is the structure of sodium stearate which is one of the components of soap All right, so now what I want to do is I want to draw a cartoon of what something like sodium stearate, sodium laurate, whatever, and what you got is you got, you know, hydrocarbon. Hey, we know all about intermolecular forces. These are nonpolar, right? And those bends are supposed to be carbon chains. And then you got something that is charged. So if I tried to draw, you know, what this would look like, I mean, of course, this would might be 22 carbons long. I just kind of quit there. So what you got is you got a portion of the molecule which is nonpolar here, this whole portion. And then you got a portion that's polar, 
or the polar, polar, I almost said polar. And so if I were to draw a little cartoon of this, let's say you spill some grease on you, something nonpolar. Here's your shirt. Here's this nonpolar material. And now if I draw this little kind of cartoon, you know, you got like a nonpolar tail and a polar head. Whoops. And then you got the kind of the polar part dissolves in the water. And the nonpolar part dissolves in the nonpolar substance. Could be an oil, could be fat molecules. And so what you'd do is you'd end up like taking little tiny, little tiny, what we call my cells. So the tail is affiliated. And it's kind of funny. You say, hey, can something be polar and nonpolar at the same time? Yeah. This is a big molecule. It's got a polar end and a nonpolar end. And so this is how most emulsifiers or soaps, detergents work. And you would have, now look, hey, don't confuse this with biology class. You'd be like saying, what are they, are they backing their way in there now, Mike? Beep, beep. No, that's different. This is, this is a molecule that's got a nonpolar tail and a polar head. And so you can go wash your hands and, uh, and you will find out that the stuff that doesn't normally mix, because usually we have this term like dissolves like. And you'll hear that a lot. Like dissolves like. That's a great thing to carry with you the rest of your life. Polar dissolves polar. Nonpolar dissolves nonpolar. So this hydrocarbon part will dissolve in oil or fat. And the, the polar head will, will be affiliated with the water. And uh, these little tiny emulsified particles are going to be able to wash off your hands or your clothes or whatnot. So that's kind of the magic of soap. And man, soap is one of those molecular innovations that has really changed people's lives in terms of sanitation and uh, all sorts of stuff. Now, by the way, hey, uh, this stuff will precipitate in hard water because those calcium and magnesium will bind to that. But, you know, it, synthetic detergents will have, instead of a carb, uh, uh, acid group here, it'll have like a sulfate or something like that. They tend to be a little more impervious to hard water, but yep, the, the enemy of soap is calcium carbonate, as we talked about it, or the dissolved form where the positive ions will precipitate out those soap particles, and that's called uh, soap scum in science. So folks, that's a little bit about colloids and suspensions and and I thought I'd throw in there a little bit about emulsifiers. If you've got a if you got a molecule which can behave as as a polar end and nonpolar end, that's what emulsifiers are. And so uh, that's a little bit of background on that. Folks, this has been a tough tough couple chapters, but uh, we ended with trivia and so we're going to go a little short with you today. So uh, we will see you next time when we talk about kinetics. Bye.